challenge before us is great, but the time for action is now, and I will not let you down. I just want to congratulate Mike Johnson. He will be a great speaker of the House, and we were very happy to help. I've known him for a long time. He's a tremendous leader. We're standing with Israel against Hamas terrorism. We're standing with Ukraine against Putin's tyranny. Hello, I'm Major Garrett in Washington. Welcome to America Decides. After 21 days, America finally has a Speaker of the House of Representatives. His name is Louisiana Republican Congressman Mike Johnson. He claimed the gavel this afternoon. Three other GOP nominees in waiting, Steve Scalise, Jim Jordan, and Tom Emmer, each failed to unite the Republican Party. All of them are better known than Johnson with also, large factions of Republican dissenters aligned against them. What does all this mean? Well, one might suggest this is the consensus of the exhausted. House Republicans simply got tired of fighting with one another in this protracted conversation about who would the next speaker be. It also might be a reflection of something that Matt Gates said today, that MAGA is ascendant in the House of Representatives. And Gates has a particular point of view on this since he is the one who helped engineer the ouster of the previous House Speaker, Kevin McCarthy. One other thing might be observed, former President Trump cannot necessarily elect a Speaker of the House, but he can diselect one. And for that proof, all you need to do is check in with Tom Emmer of Minnesota, who only yesterday afternoon was the most likely Republican to claim the speakership until Trump said he was opposed to him. And very shortly thereafter, Emmer withdrew. CBS News congressional correspondent Nicole Killian joins us now with her perspective on what can only be described as yet another dramatic, but in this case, conclusive day. Nicole? Yeah, and certainly a collective sigh of relief uh, in the chamber on both sides of the aisle, although certainly there is a big task ahead for uh, this new speaker, Mike Johnson. But look, uh, you know, this was a very exhaustive process, as you just laid out, and really paralyzed the House for the better part of three weeks, where they have not been able to do any work any business because of this stalemate over a House speaker. Uh, already the House has moved forward, for instance, with a resolution on the floor to condemn Hamas following the uh, deadly attack in Israel. And of course, there are a lot of big questions that remain in terms of what next steps uh, Speaker Johnson may take with respect to that aid package, for instance, uh, that President Biden has now sent to Congress, which includes Funding requests for Israel, for Ukraine, Taiwan, the U.S.-Mexico border. Will he keep it intact? Will he try to split it apart? Uh, that remains to be seen. Also, his approach to potentially preventing a government shutdown next month. Uh, Johnson has made clear uh, that he does want to accelerate the appropriations process, but whether that can get done by the middle of November, which is when this government deadline hits, funding deadline hits, uh, also remains to be seen. Nicole, in the nominating speech for Mike Johnson, Elise Stefanik said that he is a friend to all, an enemy to none. Is one of the reasons Mike Johnson is the new Speaker of the House because he simply hasn't been around long enough to either offend people or create any enemies? Well, to a certain extent, it's anything but dot, 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 anything but McCarthy, anything but Scalise, anything but Jim Jordan, anything but Tom Emmer. I mean, look, you know, there was a sense within the conference that it might be time for a fresh face. That was certainly the concern that some members had in, for instance, elevating someone like Steve Scalise or Tom Emmer. They didn't want it to be seen as just an easy promotion for either of those two. Plus, keep in mind their proximity to former House Speaker uh, Kevin McCarthy in terms of that leadership structure. So even though he is the vice chair of the Republican conference, there is some distance uh, in terms of leadership there. Uh, so that is potentially uh, one reason. But uh, at this point, uh, to your point earlier, there also is just a collective sense of exhaustion that there is a lot of work to get done in this House, and they simply couldn't keep fighting over who the next speaker should be. For all of your hard work these many, many days, Day, midday, long into the night, Nicole Killian, we thank you very much. You bet. To discuss former President Donald Trump's impact on the outcome of this speaker race, CBS News Chief Election and Campaign Correspondent Robert Costa joins us now. Robert, your perspective on what Trump did or didn't mean 
in this speakership battle now resolved? Well, former President Trump had his hand on the scale in terms of endorsing Jim Jordan, but he has control of the Republican Party in spirit, even if it's not direct. He's not running it from the courtroom in Manhattan today. But when you have now Speaker Johnson at the fore of the party, this is someone who denied the election, who was in repeatedly in yep. the trenches with Trump in 2020 and early 2021. So for Trump, it's a political victory because you don't see someone who's moving into this very important role in the country who's in any way distant from him. Uh, Mike Johnson, as Speaker of the House, might not be embracing Trump at every turn. He's not as close to Trump personally as Jim Jordan and others in the House, but he's of the Trump wing of the GOP. And yet, those who were not regarded as Trumpian enough, Kevin McCarthy, Steve Scalise, Tom Emmer, all retain positions in senior elected positions within the House Republican Conference. So though Mike Johnson, more MAGA identified than them, sits atop it, the infrastructure is still there. The one that the hardest, most Trumpian inspired House Republicans found insufficiently loyal to become Speaker of the House. It's still all there. And won't Johnson have to rely on it to a certain extent? And Johnson is going to have to rely on the Trump movement to provide the kind of dollars he needs to try to hold on to the House majority next year. But this is, to me, such an indicator of where the House Republicans are. As we were discussing earlier during our special report coverage, this is a House where backbenchers, those who aren't part of the leadership, though Johnson was part of the leadership in Nominally, a sense. Nominally, on the edge. vice chair. On the edge. But those who are backbenchers, those who come from kind of rural districts, red districts, who don't have competitive seats, uh, who are really aligned with Trump politically, they want to run this House of Representatives. They want it in their image. They want the appropriations and spending to be how they see it, not how the, the party leadership sees it or how K Street sees it or, of course, the Democrats. And that leads to someone like Mike Johnson actually having this path to the speakership. They want someone who doesn't have a record because that's like them. They want someone who's not known. That's like them. And having Emmer and Scalise there is fine because they've been weakened by this process. And in Johnson, they have someone who they don't believe is going to become some kind of major new figure right. who's going to change the party in the House, but he'll be someone they can go to and say, hey, you're one of us. Let's look at this from the Democrats' perspective for just a second. I'm sure you've received texts. I know how I have today from Democrats saying, well, this three-week process has nationalized something that is not typically nationalized. Who's the Speaker of the House? And what that means for Democrats is in their pursuit of the House majority next year, they will talk about Mike Johnson as an election denier, as someone who is an from their perspective, so opposed to abortion rights as to be almost absolutist on that and on other issues that they will attack and make that part of their larger narrative against all Republicans seeking to claim or retain House seats. We'll see. I mean, that is the Democratic plan at this initial moment. And you think about the past. Newt Gingrich in the 90s became such a political target because he was a celebrity politician. You've written extensively about that with your book, The Enduring Revolution. You had Nancy Pelosi. 20 years ago, 15 years ago, fire Pelosi was the refrain by Republicans. She was a celebrity speaker of the House. Mike Johnson's the anti-celebrity. He's not known by even some House Republicans. So for Democrats, they might want to define him early. But what's going but to he's be not as easily definable if I hear not, you as Jim Jordan would have been. That's right. But we're going to have to see how does Johnson use this new stature? Mm -hmm. Does he start going on all the shows and making speeches, becoming this figure who is right wing and proud of it and out there? Or is he more of a low key speaker? We've seen that in House history. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the Speaker of the House is more of a functionary, someone who's running the House for the rest of the members. And the next couple of weeks, as you know, Robert, are going to be vital to getting some sense of what kind of speaker he's going to be, because decisions will have to be made. And the fissures within the House Republican Conference about spending, about keeping the government open, those are going to come to the fore immediately. And it's going to be such a test for someone who doesn't have much experience, if any, at this level of politics. It's like going respectively from like the AAA baseball leagues to the major leagues. This is major league baseball when you have a government shutdown at the lease on the horizon. Is he going to endure a government shutdown just months into his speakership all while two wars are raging abroad? Maybe he, he does that. Maybe they want to take that kind of line on spending. I could see that happening. The House Republicans who back Johnson saying, well, we'll endure a, a fight, a shutdown for quite some time. But there's a cost to all of this in politics. Very much so. Robert Costa, we thank you very, very you. much. President Biden says the future of the Middle East should include a two-state solution for Israelis and Palestinians. More on his remarks next, your streaming.
America decides. Together, we're standing with Israel against Hamas terrorism. We're standing with Ukraine against Putin's tyranny. Mr. Prime Minister, the alliance between Australia and the United States has never been more important than it is today. Welcome back to America Decides. President Biden is hosting Prime Minister Anthony Albanese of Australia at the White House today. In a joint press conference, Biden called Australia a, quote, anchor to peace and prosperity. Nancy Cordes and Paul Salem join us now. Nancy, of course, CBS News Chief White House Correspondent. Paul is the president and CEO of the Middle East Institute. Nancy, let me start with you on the North Lawn. Summarize the day for us and the most important pronouncements from the president and the Australian prime minister on a world that is definitely convulsed. The most uh, important pronouncements from the president definitely had to do with uh, the uh, conflagration we're seeing in the Middle East right now, a conflagration that uh, White House officials very candidly are concerned could grow into a wider conflict that draws in neighboring countries and the United States itself. The president said uh, in that press conference today that while he supports Israel's right to defend itself, that he is concerned about innocent Palestinians being caught in the crossfire. He is concerned about humanitarian aid making its way to them. And he emphasized, Major, that when this is all over, we can't go back to the way things were before. He said that th that is simply not possible, that there needs to be a two-state solution that respects the rights of Palestinians. We didn't come out and, uh, and directly co uh, uh, condemn the Israelis for anything that they're doing, though he did condemn what he described as extremist settlers in the West Bank, who he said are now attacking Palestinians, uh, some of them at least. But uh, he did say that there needs to be a paradigm shift and that a two-state solution needs to be back on the table. Paul, I want to play for you a soundbite from the president's press conference in the Rose Guard today along the lines of what Nancy just summarized. Let's take a quick listen. Israelis and Palestinians equally deserve to live side by side in safety, dignity, and peace. There's no going back to the status quo as it stood on October the 6th. That means ensuring Hamas can no longer terrorize Israel and use Palestinian civilians as human shields. It also means that when this crisis is over, there has to be a vision of what comes next. And in our view, it has to be a two-state solution. Paul, there's a lot in there, as you well know. I hear in that a not-so-mild rebuke of the Netanyahu government, which has, in its formation, led on and encouraged hardline Israelis to talk about retaking the West Bank, increasing the reality of settlements there, and the Netanyahu administration's thinking it had sort of an economic understanding with Hamas that was manageable. Both of those are now in very sharp conflict with one another. What did you hear and what the president had to say, and how, how do you react? Well, thank you, Major. First of all, I'm, I'm very heartened to see uh, and to hear what the president said. It was very wise to lay out a strategic roadmap uh, for the uh, crisis that we are living through now, the horrific attacks by Hamas in Israel, and a very natural reaction from the Israeli side. But at the end of the day, there needs to be a direction to which the region is going, to which both Israelis and Palestinians, as well as their Arab neighbors, can go towards. And I do think it's America's proper role to lead the way in that strategic vision. Let's not forget the 90, 70, 1973 war, mm -hmm. which was a much bigger threat to Israel, led to the Camp David Accords and peace between Egypt and Israel. The uh, first Gulf War and the first Palestinian Intifada mm -hmm. led to the Madrid peace process and the Oslo Accords. Uh, so sadly, crises and wars can also be opportunities for change, and I think it was very wise and strategic of the president to lay that forward. Nancy, picking up on what Paul just said, all the things he listed required tremendous involvement of an American administration on a daily, if not hour by hour basis. Oftentimes, I can remember American presidents sending either envoys or the Secretary of State to the region repeatedly to pay attention, to nurture, to midwife, if you will, negotiations over whatever the complexities were. Is the Biden White House prepared to get that engaged on the other side of this conflict? 
certainly I think President Biden himself is, is willing to do that. I mean, keep in mind, this is someone who was the chair of the Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate. He was, when he was vice president, uh, he was sort of a, a diplomat in chief flying around the world. And he's somebody who has a decades long relationship with Bibi Netanyahu. So he's fairly comfortable on the international stage and he's been uh, nurturing relationships not necessarily with uh, the Israeli prime minister over the past year and a half, because he has sort of famously been at odds with Netanyahu over the, some of the things that he's been trying to do that uh, President Biden says have pulled the country too far to the right. But uh, he's been building an international coalition uh, to, to deal with the situation in Ukraine that could be refo refocused to deal with the situation in the Middle East. So I think uh, it's, it's certainly a topic that he would relish tackling whether he can make more progress than past U.S. presidents have been able to do remains to be seen. Uh, that is an extremely tall order, as I'm sure Paul can tell you uh, more than anyone. Paul, one of the hardest things here, let's be honest, is this decoupling of Hamas from Palestinian aspirations in Gaza specifically, but generally for a two-state solution. Is that achievable? Can you decouple one from the other? And Militarily, if the Israelis do go in as expected, can they be decoupled or will they be seen by the sympathetic Arab world as fused and therefore adding to the complication of resolving this? Well, I think Hamas has dealt itself out of any future political process uh, by their terrorist atrocities uh, against innocent civilians in Israel. Uh, I don't think they will be part of any future political arrangement. They might survive in Gaza or parts of Gaza. But a political future between the Israelis and Palestinians and their Arab neighbors, brokered by the U.S., will largely have to go through the Palestinian Authority and will have to largely include concessions on the West Bank, as well as new arrangements in Gaza or parts of Gaza. Will that mean some way to rehabilitate the image and the efficacy of the Palestinian Authority? Because one of the reasons Hamas exists, as you well know much better than I do, is it has viewed as a better choice by some Palestinians than what they regarded as a weak or corrupt Palestinian Authority. Well, certainly the Palestinian Authority has uh, deep problems. It uh, hasn't held elections for the longest time. The current president, Mahmoud Abbas, has far outlived his legitimacy. It needs to be politically rehabilitated. But also successive Israeli governments have made sure to keep it weak, to keep it uh, unable to really stand up on its own feet. That's been part of a sustained strategy and a strategy that is, as you said initially, uh, felt somewhat comfortable with Hamas, that it's some, a party they know that it would occasionally lob a few rockets, but it would be manageable. We have to think of a radically different future, a future where the Palestinian Authority is given much more encouragement and support. It needs to reform it own, its own self internally. But we're also in a new positive moment where most of the Arab countries are in an orientation of peace towards Israel and towards any future Palestinian state, unlike 30, 40 years ago. So this should be a better moment to approach these issues than in previous times. Should be. We'll see if it is. Nancy, very quickly to you. Reaction at the White House to the fact that the House now has a speaker. Uh, well, President Biden said he looks forward to speaking with uh, Congressman Mike Johnson and getting to work with him. There are obviously several major deadlines looming. They need to fund the government. Uh, they need to figure out what they're going to do about a package of aid that the president has asked for for Ukraine and Israel uh, and they'll be starting from scratch, essentially, Major, because the president and, and Mike Johnson really don't have much of a relationship at all. Nancy Cordes on the North Lawn of the White House. Paul Salem here at the desk with me. Thank you very much. The chaos to select a new speaker has rocked Washington for the better part of three weeks. But does it matter on the campaign trail? Well, we will take you to Iowa to find out. You are streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. As we have been reporting, Republican Congressman Mike Johnson of Louisiana has been voted the new House Speaker. This comes after three unsuccessful weeks of various speaker bids and chaos and confusion and legislative paralysis. It also happened while candidates for the Republican nomination are in the throes of primary season. I want to go to Iowa now and talk to CBS News campaign reporter Nydia Cavazos. She is joining us from Des Moines. So, Nydia, Based on your interaction with voters there in Iowa, did they have any strong feelings about the speaker vote? 
Yes, Major, good evening. Iowa residents and voters here have had a lot to say during the past days and during the past events. As you know, many GOP candidates have been here in Iowa campaigning. Many of the voters who I've spoken to, they identify themselves as Republicans, but they're not necessarily proud of where their political party stands right now. It's a combination of what they describe as shame, and it's also a combination of them wanting to have a speaker in the first place. But overall, there's also a consensus among voters and residents residents here in Iowa that they say that this situation in itself could have been avoided and should have been avoided from the very beginning. Let's take a listen. I, I think it's a shame. I really, really do. I, I think they should have been able to come together and work that through a long time ago. I think they should have had somebody in line before they ousted McCarthy. I, I don't really have an opinion whether he should be gone or not. But yeah, they should have somebody lined up, ready to go when they, they got rid of the hard to yeah. As I've spoken to some of these voters throughout the past days, it, this is sort of a laughing matter to them, and it's also somewhat of a disbelief to them. They say over and over that they can't believe that this situation had to escalate and get to this point where we're at right now. In fact, they say that they should have had a plan from the very beginning. And some of the voters who I spoke to said, Republicans in Congress are making us look bad. And as I had previously mentioned, many here in Iowa identify themselves as Republicans, but that's far from feeling proud of where their political party stands now. So, Nydia, how much of this was something that the Republicans campaigning for the nomination in Iowa were talking about themselves, meaning it was part of their presentation, or were they getting questions about it from people they were interacting with? Well, when it comes to some of the voters and the residents here in Iowa, this wasn't necessarily what amongst one of their major concerns. In fact, what they're most concerned about is that it's listening to GOP candidates who have come here to Iowa to campaign. And they are genuinely interested in listening to what candidates have to say, what their platforms are, and in fact, what their solutions are to many of the issues that are currently happening across the world, from the war in Israel and Hamas to the U.S. southern border. So residents are coming into these numerous events from town halls to even tailgates during the weekend to listen in and really get a sense of what these candidates are offering, because there is a general consensus here in Iowa, a sort of fatigue. They're just tired of this chaos and of this drama, as they've described it, especially with what's been happening in Congress for the past three weeks. A new member of our campaign team, 2024, Nydia Cavazos. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Major. House Republicans proclaimed themselves unified and happy today. Good for them. They elected a speaker. That, we should remind ourselves, is the bare minimum of House functionality. But before Republicans got happy, they were divided and deeply frustrated. And in the depths of that despair, some reached for gallows humor in the form of movie memes, illustrating their political woes. Two frequent memes came from the same movie, Animal House, such as this one depicting what Republicans thought they were doing to themselves. And then there's this one, searching for order where none could be found. As was said in the movie, knowledge is good. May House Republicans be more knowledgeable now about what it takes to leave the House. That does it for today. You can stream America Decides Monday to Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. You are streaming. See you next week.